And ever since I started my digital art journey, I've had Clip Studio Paint with me. Over time, I've come to love three tools that every artist should know about. They've saved me tons of time and effort and helped me create this illustration right here. In this video, I'll teach you the basics of how to use each tool and share how I used it for my illustration so that you too can start creating your own masterpiece. Without further ado, I want to introduce the Perspective Ruler, Vector Layers, and the 3D Features. Note that all three features are available in both the Pro version and the EX version. If you're a beginner or haven't used Clip Studio Paint before, check out our beginner guide linked in the description. A free trial is available and can be used for Windows, Mac OS, iOS, Android, and Chromebook. Go try it for yourself! A million thanks to Clip Studio Paint for sponsoring this video. Before we begin, I want to share a few things to make this experience as smooth as possible. In case you ever need help, hover over the names or icons and it'll have a description. Do note that this feature is exclusive to desktop. If you ever accidentally close a tool or function, you could get it back by clicking on Window on the top, then checking for what you're missing. I am using the Windows version. I've modified my workspace, but not majorly. Keep that in mind when you see some parts that may be in different places. I also want to give everybody a heads up on two things. The Operation Tool and the Tool Property tab. The Operation Tool is going to be your best friend. This is a handy tool that lets you access the settings for all the tools we have for today. The Tool Properties tab is where you can adjust almost all the features you select with the Operation Tool. It also has useful settings that you can adjust for things like brush settings and the features we'll be going over today. Now that we're all on the same page, let's get it. The first tool I want to talk about is the Perspective Ruler. This ruler can be used early on to draft a drawing from the ground up or added later into the sketch to make sure that your perspective is accurate. It can also work as a great learning tool using the Perspective Ruler to measure a photograph's vanishing points. To add a Perspective Ruler, click on Layer, Create Perspective Ruler, and simply pick the perspective you'd like to do. You can click on any part of the ruler with the Operations tool, and check the Tool Properties tab. There are three buttons here that lets you visualize a grid on each of the axes. On here, you're also able to change the size of the grid. Now that we have our ruler, you could click on the ruler with the operation tool and you get to see all these dots to move the controls. This dot here lets you move the horizon line up and down. The vanishing points slide on the horizon line making it easy to adjust. Another way to move the vanishing point is through these purple guidelines coming off of the vanishing point. You could use the left and right handles here to slide the vanishing point all across the horizon line, letting you easily adjust instead of having to manually drag the vanishing point all the way out there. And just to make sure that our respective ruler is lining up properly, I will test it on this house and see how all the lines are perfectly lining up on the frames and the doors. And with the perspective ruler, you can actually see that this house's window is slightly crooked. Here are some cool tips. To move the ruler onto different layers, click on the ruler and drag it onto a different one. If you find the lines a bit too distracting, you could go on to File, Preferences, Ruler slash Unit, and change Opacity of Ruler slash Grid slash Crop Mark. If you want your perspective ruler to work on all layers, all you have to do is right click the ruler and be sure to check the option that you'd like. You could click on these two icons up here, which deactivate snapping onto rulers. You can also just hide the layer that the ruler is on. To take full advantage of perspective rulers, I like to use vector layers. It's great for drawing character line work and for building complex building details. The features I'm about to talk about are only available if you use a vector layer, so keep that in mind. To put it simply, vector layers let you edit the lines you draw with anchor points. Its functions are perfect for refining your line work. With the operation tool, you could click on each of the lines that you've ever made on a vector layer by holding shift and clicking all of the ones you want to select. You're also able to copy paste the lines. You can change the color of the lines with the operation tool. You can change the brush shape and even its size. Vector Eraser is one of my favorite tools. I'll just let the footage do the work here. It allows you to erase an entire line up until it crosses with a different line. Vector layers give you full control over your line work, speeding up the process and makes your line work experience smooth. Last but not least is the 3D features. 
you can really feel that the 3D features were made for illustrators because it's so easy to just jump between 3D and 2D. You can grab all the 3D objects and other materials through this tab on the very right. On the 3D category, you can see the primitive tab and the body type tab. To place a 3D object on your scene, all you gotta do is drag and drop. First thing I want to showcase is the 3D primitives, which are basic 3D forms that you could customize. Click on the 3D object with the operation tool. You can change the number of subdivisions on the tool properties tab, which add lines on our primitives that can be used as reference lines for measurements. Some primitives like the prism and the pyramid will actually change based on some subdivisions. If any of the options are hidden, just click on the plus or minus symbol to open the drop down menu. If you ever want a clearer view instead of having to look at the tool properties tab, you can click on the wrench icon for an expanded view of the options seen here. Now it's time to talk about the 3D controls. This icon right here lets you spin the camera around the object. This one lets you drag the camera up and down, left and right. This one right here lets you pull the camera back and forward onto the object. This icon lets you drag the object around. This one lets you spin the object. This one lets you rotate sideways. This one lets you rotate around. This one slides the object around the ground. Do note that moving the camera and moving the object are two completely different things. Moving the camera will simply change your view of the object, while moving the object moves the object all around in the 3D space. You can also manipulate the object itself with these handles right here. These handles let you manipulate the shape of the object, stretching it in all the different axes. This one gives you a uniform scale for the entire object. You can also rotate the object with these handles. Technically it's the same as rotating with the icon, but the handles give you more control. In case you want to undo any of your changes, you could simply reset the model scale or the model rotation. The snapping is perfect for giving you an even distribution on space. For example, letting you snap onto the middle, or snapping onto the surface of the other object. So if you have two objects in your scene and you don't want them to snap onto each other, then you can simply turn off the icon. This camera icon will let you pick between presets of camera angles. They have these cute icons to show you what the preset angles will look like on the object. This button centers your camera onto the object, and this one will put your object onto the ground level. Before I continue, I want to talk about a few more tips. You can rasterize 3D layers to turn them into flat layers. It'll stop being a 3D layer, but if you change your mind, you can always undo it. And if you think you'll change your mind far ahead, don't worry, you could easily just copy paste the layer before you rasterize. The nice thing about adding any 3D object is that it automatically makes a perspective ruler for you. The perspective ruler will stay and not be deleted if you rasterize the layer. Scrolling with your mouse will make space between the vanishing points, adding perspective distortion. You're also able to change this on the tool properties tab, going under angle and changing the perspective slider. There is a wealth of content in the Clip Studio Paint Asset Store, including free ones, so be sure to check it out if you'd like. Next up is the 3D mannequin. There are two types of mannequins, one with more anime proportions and one that's more realistic. Both of them come with masculine and feminine builds, and they're super customizable. You can see the body customization options in the tool properties tab. Just like before, you're still able to access an expanded view of the options with the wrench icon. On the menu, this button right here lets you reset the entire mannequin back to its original form. This button saves the current body as a preset so that you could use it anytime. We'll use this feature in a little bit. And on the sliders, you'll be able to change their height. You can change the head to body ratio and really mess around with the settings here. <laughs> or this one, each axis of the graph is what decides the body type, letting you mix and match the body proportions. Farthest left lets you turn the mannequin super skinny, the very right makes them weighty, going up makes them super muscular, and going down lessens their muscle mass. If you want to do a fine tuning of the body proportions, you could hit these buttons down here to move on the graph point by point. This diagram on the side represents the entire mannequin. 
Having it on the big blue bar lets you adjust the entirety of the mannequin's body. Clicking on each body part will let you adjust each of them individually. Highly recommend that you play around with this graph and see what you make. If you uh, regret what you did to these people, you could always hit this icon right here to reset their scale. And if you set each of the individual body parts, you can reset the scale of each of them. On the other hand, if you want to keep your creation close to your heart, you can save body shape as a material, name it, and pick which file location you want to save it in. Be sure to give your materials a tag so you could easily search for it. And to apply it again, all you gotta do is drag and drop onto the character. There you go. Just like how you remember them. This way of saving materials applies to most things, like body types, poses, and hand poses. So create presets to your heart's content. For posing, I want to start off with the hand controls. You'll be able to find the hand controls under Pose in the Tool Properties tab. Just like before, you'll be able to access these controls through the wrench icon. There is a handy dandy graph, convenient for hand posing. Each corner represents a hand pose. For the clenched fist, you're able to customize where you want the thumb to be. If you don't click on any individual hand, both poses will apply to both hands. These icons let you lock up each individual finger. Use this in combination with the graph to make the pose you want. This button lets you flip the pose. On here, you'll find buttons so that you can save the body pose as a material, the left hand pose, and the right hand pose as a material. The process of saving these materials is pretty much the same as the process shown earlier. Feel free to scroll back if you need a refresher. To access the presets, you could go onto Pose. Then drag and drop the hand pose you'd like onto the character. You could also click on one hand to apply it individually. Another option for posing the hands is to use the handles to pose the individual fingers. Moving on to posing the entire body, you can see the same handles that are used for the 3D primitives. But this time there's an important distinction. There's the handles for adjusting each part of the body. There are also handles that adjust the entire body as a whole. To access individual parts, you just have to click on it once. And to access the full body, you just have to click on the same body part a second time. The 3D models are nicely articulated, and I really suggest playing around with the handles. My biggest tip for creating poses is to just jump in and try it. If you're having trouble with the handles, you could also click and drag so that you could freely move the body part around. You can flip the model pose horizontally with this icon right here. Below is a button that'll let you revert to default pose and reset model rotation. Pretty much all the controls from 3D primitives earlier pass on to this one. You can also lock specific joints so that they don't get affected when you pose other parts of the body. In this pose I'm making, the arm is where all of the weight is being balanced, so it's important that it doesn't move. By locking the joints, I can design the pose around the arm. To unlock it, all you need to do is to click on the lock joint and press the icon again. There's also another icon that lets you unlock all the lock joints. The 3D features are excellent for blocking out scenes and creating poses that you might have trouble picturing or looking references for. Not only that, the perspective ruler it automatically creates makes it super smooth to block stuff out in 3D, then switching it to drawing with accurate perspective. And now, I've talked about the basics of all of these three tools. I've only scratched the surface, and these tools will only truly shine with how you use them. And with that, it's time to talk about the illustration and how these features we went over played a role in creating it. For this drawing, I knew that I wanted to put a person and background to go along with it. I wanted to do something really perspective heavy, something perfect that would really showcase all the tools we talked about earlier. I knew I had to put a person in there for scale. You can see that I copy paste this lady here and I use her as a sort of measuring stick so that I know how big these buildings are. I knew I wanted a tower from the very beginning because I wanted something that looked like it would pierce the heavens. Something that makes you think it's reaching for the skies and all that. Something cool like that. <laughs> so I wanted to use really simple cubes just to block everything out. And then after I'm done blocking everything out, I could just use it as a base and really carve it. Sculpt some cool shapes out of these square buildings. 
I didn't want a super fancy pose for this one, so I just had her standing there mostly for scale. But, you know, to showcase the posing stuff, I did a little bit just to, just to really showcase it for this drawing. And then afterwards, I jump into 2D just to, just to decide what kind of character this person would be. I wasn't completely sure at first, but what came to mind was a witch because drawing pretty magical. <laughs> so I thought it was pretty fitting to turn her into a witch. I make another copy of the mannequin here and put her way, way far in the back, just so I know the scale of the tower in comparison to the heights of this lady. I really didn't have much of an idea going into this drawing, and it just tends to take shape as I go. It's more fun that way, especially if it's this easy to just kind of block out, play around, and you have all these tools to really guide you and just let you go ham, you know? At this point, I'm starting to also block in the, the shading, you know, the values of this overall drawing. Super important after all. And actually, I remember I did the initial sketch that you can see here, but then after waking up and looking at the drawing again, it felt a little claustrophobic. So I just made a copy of the 3D model, the 3D block out that I made, and I changed the angle a little bit because the tower was kind of taking up a lot of space. And easy as pie, I spent like 15 minutes just simply turning the camera around a little, giving more space to the building. And afterwards, I was way more happier with this because, again, so much more sky space, less claustrophobic. And just like that, I changed the composition in like 15 minutes, when usually it took a lot of work just to, just to change the camera a little. But thanks to the block out, it's easy peasy. Here's a little comparison of what used to look like initially. And here's what it looks like after. With all this space in the background, it gives it a lot more depth now, and I'm super happy with the sense of scale everything has. I wanted to go for a more geometric style of buildings here. Lots of squares, lots of cubes, but I really wanted to break it up with all of this trees. Make it look more organic, break up all those geometric shapes. With the perspective ruler, I'm putting in all the finer details of this building. The snapping is really nice and it really helped me just focus on designing the building instead of having to worry about perspective and if it's going on to the proper vanishing point. It really saves me the time and effort. I used it to design the building way at the back there as well and the little catwalk. I plan on keeping the speed paint part a little bit brief, just focusing on the three tools we talked about today. So sadly, I'm going to skip over talking about color. But let us know if you're interested in seeing more speed paints with full commentary. And now I'm finally starting the line art. I use the vector layers here and it's been super, super convenient, <laughs> to say the least. To just be able to really adjust my lines and copy paste them. Ah, such a godsend. <laughs> Especially, not, not to mention, using the, using the vector eraser. Oh my gosh, makes it so much easier. The subdivisions come into play a little bit here. You can see that I mark it with 1 to 7, just to make sure that I'm not miscounting. And I wanted to use them to measure where the gate was. Yeah, and I wanted to thank everybody for making it this far into the video. And if you'd like to support us to keep making free stuff, you can support us on Patreon. You get cool stuff like working files from our streams. And most importantly, you get feedback from our talented, talented instructors. Yeah, go check it out if you're interested. And just like that, with the power of all the tools, I made this masterpiece. And if you're curious, it took me about 10 hours to put all this stuff together from scratch. From blocking it out, to sketching, coloring, painting, and finalizing the overall drawing. Thanks to the perspective ruler, vector layers, and the 3D tools, I was able to confidently draw this illustration. What I love more than the fact that these tools make drawing quicker is that it makes drawing difficult art topics like backgrounds way more accessible for beginners. It's inspired confidence in me to try drawing backgrounds and has made studying perspective a lot more exciting for me. If you've created artwork using these tools, tag Wing Canvas on Instagram or join our Discord where you can share it with our awesome art community. If you're already a Clip Studio Paint user, try these tools out for yourself. If you don't have the program yet, you can download a free trial link in the description. That's all I have for this video, and remember to keep on keeping on.
Join a virtual art class to learn live from our professional artists. Get creative assignments, individual guidance, and real-time feedback on your artwork. Start today and level up your practice. If you learned something new, please like and share this video with a fellow art nerd. If you love receiving quality and free arts education, subscribe. Here's a couple other videos you could check out next.